Start recording in just one second. Okay. Um, yeah, we're we're good. Whenever everyone's ready, we can maybe just do introductions first. Is it is it corny to ask for a benediction before we begin? Not at all. Like that. I think that will be wonderful. Should I start? Please. I don't know that Isaac is a, a priest or not, so I'm, I'm deferring to you, Father Thomas. Okay, great. I will defer to you as well. Let's say a word of prayer. Barak in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one true God. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for this opportunity for us uh, to assemble from our various locations to assemble virtually uh, through all these mediums that you have allowed hum human beings to have. Lord, uh, allow this conversation to be led by you and guided by you. May it be an exchange of hearts uh, and of uh, enlightening experience to come to know you more and to come to uh, to understand our role in, in the world and how we can serve you. Uh, bless this podcast endeavor, especially as it starts off. Bless the, the servants who are uh, using it to, um, to bring together faith and life and made for, made be for the glory of your holy name, and for the um, for the baptizing of of, uh, of the whole world and spreading your gospel to those around us. We praise you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and always, forever and ever. Amen. So I'd like to just begin by uh, thanking you and welcoming you all to coming on today. This is uh, I think going to be the first episode that we uh, release. And if you don't mind, I would just like you know you to inter, you know introduce yourselves and uh, tell us a little bit about you know what what sort of drew you to Saint Isaac, why you're interested in him, what's compelling about him to you personally. Isaac, why don't you go? You're the you're the one with the namesake. Uh, uh, all right. Um, uh, well, I'm. Uh, let's see. I'm. Not too many details. Uh, I am a, an Eastern Christian myself. Um, I'm uh, I'm also um, uh, Eastern Christianity, theology, uh, philosophy are all re research interests of mine. Um, and I came across uh, Saint Isaac um, sort of early on uh, in that journey, um, academically and spiritually. Um, and so. Uh, I guess there's a there's an affinity there, hence the the, the pseudonym. Um, but anyway, so the, I mean, it's it's pretty basic. There's no uh, no special reason other than that. Just in an uh, interest. So I'm Father Michael Gillis. I'm the pastor of the Holy Nativity Antiochian Orthodox Church in Langley, British Columbia. Um, I have a podcast. Uh, and blog called Praying in the Rain that uh, sort of focuses on uh, the spiritual life when things aren't very nice, like when it's raining, uh, and reflects on it from uh, ancient and contemporary church fathers. Um, I read St. Isaac a lot, and uh, the last few years I've also begun um, reading uh, Maximus the Confessor quite a bit. So, there you go. Um, so, introducing myself, um, I uh, was born in uh, South India, immigrated to America when I was 10. I um, uh, 
after college, while in college, I felt a call into the priesthood. After college, I, a couple of years of work, I went to the seminary in India. I came back, got ordained, got married, and I uh, tried to continue my studies. And, um, you know, I because the Malankara Church, the church that I belong to, is uh, liturgically Syriac, I, you know, I'm really interested in Syriac asceticism, Syriac writers, and um, uh, including... Um, uh, uh, Isaac the Syrian, who is kind of not part of the communion that I belong to, and so you know, it's one sense uh, uh, a stranger to that communion. But at the same time, when I, you know, it comes from the same milieu, so it comes from the same kind of um, the same Syriac world, and you can see the that they're influencing each other a lot. I, I would, I would just add to to that that I I I agree. Uh, that one of the interesting things about Isaac is that on a lot of church calendars or uh, liturgical years, he is, I don't think, entirely unique. I think there's a couple others, but he's he's very he's one of a few who um, are sort of uh, commonly revered across denominations despite not having belonged to most of them. <laughs> Yeah, so could you maybe, uh, one of you, just jump on this and explain what is his sort of background and immediate context for people that are not familiar with him? So uh, Isaac of, of Nineveh, he, is a, um, he was a, uh, I guess what today we would call the Church of the East. Well, I guess it was the Church of the East then, but <laughs> the Assyrian Church of the East today. Um, he was a bishop uh, briefly and spent most of his time as a monk. Um uh, I'm sorry you put me on the spot a little bit. Um, no, it's okay. Do we have so he's originally a Qatari mystic? Am I am I correct about that? Yes, yes, he is. And we're um, talking like seventh century. You know, his dates. Uh, I'm reading are 613 to 700 A.D. Right, uh, and that's one of the significant things, as we had just alluded to, is that that means that he is, you know, by any measure post schism. Right, uh, depending on which direction you're coming from, that'll change the date of it. But he's he's uh, he's going to be at odds with um, uh, any sort of uh, Ephesian Christians, um, and then as a result, uh, you know, so both both the what was today, today the Eastern Orthodox Communion and the uh, Oriental Orthodox Communion, and then the Catholics as well. He was. Uh, widely read even sort of early on um and i think that that part of the influence is that he gets he gets um passed sort of through the the ancient world um and becomes influential um and i i want to say that for a, for a time he's his his dates are changed right i think modern scholarship is more aware of when he lived but there's a time when He's pushed into an earlier century where it would be less problematic to um, to talk about him. Uh, plus, uh, in current times, uh, for instance, I have I have a book of his from oh, who are the ones in Boston? Holy Resurrection Monastery, um, one of those groups. Uh, but anyway, and the introduction to that book, uh, like a lot of scholarship, you'll see about him, um, you know, sort of. Uh, Sort of backpedals on how much of he how much he would have belonged to the Church of the East um, and its uh, Christology. Um, so there's there's even today there's an attempt to sort of recapture him as being you know a hundred percent Orthodox no matter how no matter what way you cut it you know so that I think that's part of it too. He he's sort of like C.S. Lewis. He's an ancient C.S. Lewis, right? Everybody wants C.S. Lewis on their side regardless of what church he belonged to. I think that's a that's a really good uh, comparison. I think, and, and also um, the, probably if we extend that comparison, I think it's probably because um, C.S. Lewis also, you know, like you know, work like Mere Christianity. Like he says, "Hey, I, I'm just doing the the introduction. Like I'm not, you know, I, I know the other stuff is really important, but I'm going to say things that most people in Christendom can agree with, and I I, I don't." Want to preach? I don't want to paint Isaac uh, the Syrian as somebody who was trying to do something like that, but but his uh, writings have that universal appeal because it's talking about um, it. 
it, it is deeply dogmatic, but without using the technical vocabulary and um, it, which can be read almost by all the different groups. Yeah, I, I would I would agree with that too. That it it is um, without. Uh, yeah, without straying from any sort of, of dogma, it, it, it's it's able to um, speak to love and mercy and things that are going to appeal to people across different denominations. So at, th- at this stage, I guess I would like to just read a brief uh, passage from one of his uh, writings. And I don't remember where I came across this, but this is the sort of introduction that I had to him as, a, as an author. And... Uh, I was really struck by the language and the, the concreteness of this, this paragraph, so I'll, I'll be brief. Uh, this is quoting, I believe, from his 81st homily. And what is a merciful heart? It is the heart burning for the sake of all creation, for men, for birds, for animals, for demons, and for every created thing. And by the recollection of them, the eyes of a merciful man pour forth abundant tears. But the strong and vehement mercy which grips his heart, and by his great compassion, his heart is humbled, and he cannot bear to hear or to see any injury or slight sorrow in creation. For this reason he offers up tearful prayer continually, even for irrational beasts, for the enemies of the truth, and for those who harm him, that they be protected and receive mercy. And in like manner he even prays for the family of reptiles, because of the great compassion that burns without measure in his heart, in the likeness of God. And I guess, to me, this is sort of the, com- the really compelling thing about St. Isaac, is this uncompromising and totally radical love and compassion that he has, not only for, you know, for God, love for God, or love for you know, the world, or an appreciation of God's love for the world, but his personal love for the world, and even the evil within it, even the demons, even, as he says, the family of reptiles. What, what I read and what I noticed is, um, as much as you were saying, he was sort of an, an uncontroversial thinker who is kind of putting forth, you know, standard dogma in more digestible ways. When you get to a lot of his writings on mercy, it does seem like a provocation. And he talks about how mercy, you know, exhausts or like overcomes justice. And he doesn't have the kind of standard, at at least in in what I'm familiar with, with like Western Christianity and Thomistic thought, you know, you you kind of see mercy and justice as equally. And and he he definitely seems to privilege mercy. And, um, you know, within the bounds of dogma, how do you kind of reconcile what he seems to be saying about mercy? Yeah, if I, I'm, I, Isaac, feel free to cut me off anytime, and you want to say something. Uh, when you when you say that, I, I, there's something that strikes me as somebody who prays the Syri- the Syriac prayers is that at its the perhaps the reason for that. Um, the for mercy to see be seen as something that overrides justice is because if mercy doesn't override justice, the prayers kind of remind us that the through the prayers we're always praying that it is only because our hope that mercy can override justice that I believe I can be saved. It's only because it's only because mercy can override justice that on that day of judgment if you judge me by justice I, 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 I'm not worthy but if you are merciful to me and merciful because your body and blood dwells in me merciful because um, I have received you um, in the baptismal font so I, I think um, you know I'm really curious to hear Isaac's uh, input on this. I think the, uh, the reason that the heart overflows with mercy or the reason that the heart ought to overflow with mercy is because it has received the mercy of Christ first. Right? It's a recipient of that mercy. And from that same wellspring, it becomes, it tries to be merciful as well. And you see this in, in moments of, of the gospel, um, whether implicitly or explicitly uh but it, it sort of goes back you, you know even to the uh, adulterous woman or something you know the the 
whoever's without sin. I mean, if we look at it from terms of sin, whoever's without sin, throw the first stone. But I think it, it's uh, like Father was just saying. Um, you know, there's that that mercy and love that we ourselves have received. So it, it, it's our duty to, in in turn, uh, you know display that same mercy are are you going to be more judgmental than the master in other words right um and uh insofar as it's different from from western thought um i'm not i don't have any um sources but i would assume that you know isaac would be would have been less familiar with uh say augustine than um people in the west would have been um that's not a certainty but you know there's at least not that sort of prevailing uh tendency that sort of takes over um which you know plenty of people have talked about it sort of gets channeled into the middle ages uh the justification of political power ends up getting tied up in the justification of god's power so you get this sort of interplay between theodicy and um <laughs> to coin a phrase, androdicy, um, you know, where the, the the king has to demonstrate his own validity through being a reflection of a god who's increasingly um, politically monarchical, I guess. Mm. But now before we get that far in the political, which I think we're, we're going to go there, I want to just take one more minute here with the concept of mercy itself and uh, just read this passage that I have in front of me so that everybody you know that's listening has this in their minds. He says that mercy is opposed to justice. Justice is a quality on the even scale, for it gives to each as he deserves. Mercy, on the other hand, is a sorrow and a pity stirred up by goodness. It does not requite a man who is deserving of evil. And to him who is deserving of good, it gives a double portion. If therefore it is evident that mercy belongs to the portion of righteousness, then justice belongs to the portion of wickedness, as grass and fire cannot exist in one place, so justice and mercy cannot abide in one soul. And I I guess what I would like to ask uh, maybe Father Thomas, since he prays the Syriac prayers, is that, when I think of justice, I think of like Plato's Republic and the idea that, you know, justice, goodness, beauty, all of these these things have a positive connotation and ultimately in God, they're all sort of synonymous. Uh, you know, we could say that like, you know, following the Psalms that, you know, uh, the, the Lord's words are pure words, all of them just, right? There's no, at least in my sort of naive, when I come to Isaac, I, I'm sort of shocked by this. And I was wondering if maybe in Syriac there's this nuance about justice and mercy that doesn't follow a sort of Greek or Latin pattern. You know, let me first um, acknowledge my um, that I, I'm not, you know, deeply read, well read enough to be able to an- answer that question fully. But I, what I would say is, I don't think it's so much the difference of how justice and mercy are looked at uh, in in Syriac versus the West, but because I think it is, um, and I think that you know what Isaac was referring to earlier is that in in a in a Western notion, um, it's kind of reductionist to say this, but I think we see this especially when we come to things like justification by faith alone. We think of just to, that God, we think that it's, we want God to be just, and we want God to be just even towards us, and we're okay with that because we we believe that, well, by my faith, I, if God is just, I'm still, that that's still a favorable result for me. But in there is no concept of justification by faith alone in the Syriac tradition. So there is still a, 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 and I think that's common to all Christendom, there's a still this idea of the beware of the judgment, right? You know, the, the three things to be always, uh, to be always uh, keep, be mindful of is death, judgment, and hell. And so uh, that's not a harsh, and that's not a, a very uh, a negative thing, I think. I think uh, when we think of the righteous judgment of God, but we pray that, Lord, don't judge me by the righteousness. Uh, and I think 
this isn't, uh, so yes, and uh, but don't judge me by the righteousness, but rather judge me in your mercy. So the question that you're asking about justice as a virtue, um, about you know the, the platonic ideal of justice as a virtue, do we strive for that? I think that um, maybe, and this might be just, this is just a, a, a I, I want to just put a, another um, Isaac, St. Isaac's quote in front of you, which I came across today, and I thought that might be, that might help answer a little bit on this. Um, he's, um, this is one of his prayers. O power whereby the fathers of the old overcame the mighty and fearsome attacks of the rebellious one. People who, though sharing in human nature, which is subject to many needs, were like those without need, manifesting on earth a likeness of things to come. So this is talking, that, that phrase, manifesting on earth a likeness of things to come. He's talking about the saints of old. And he's saying what the saints were doing was they were living in this world and they were showing to the world the world to come through their life and through their deeds. Perhaps that's what mercy does. Perhaps that's what, you know, we, we seek justice, but mercy is, is uh, you know, the, the ideal of the, of the world to come, which we only can truly enter into because he's merciful. Would it, would it be too great of a leap then to say when he speaks about justice being of the portion of wickedness and mercy being of the portion of righteousness, that the justice here is justice according to the metaphysical fall, that in justice, the world's justice is according to the portion of wickedness. But we might say that true justice or, you know, God's justice is the same thing as God's mercy. Well, and I think I think also that um, that God is going to be just to, um, for instance, death. Right, the the death things like death, sin, those will receive God's justice. Um, you know, uh, but in a way that is not expressed as as mercy, like it is to us, but it, indeed as triumph. Right. Um, so, but the you know, so it's it's placing it's placing the burden on the at fault party uh, to the extent that we can blame uh, non existent things. Yeah, yeah, no, I, 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 I agree with uh, Isaac's point, and I think to to uh, to think about what Henry was just saying about is is justice something that is kind of is God's is is Isaac talking about a mercy that is truly just in that it transcends the fallen state? I, yes, to a certain degree, because justice, you know, the plata- the to give each its due. And I think in that quote, that that idea came across, right? I mean, that's the Plato's definition, right? To give each their due. So I think that um, to give each their due, we we cannot uh, use the fall as an excuse for um, not being responsible for our actions. And so justice in its... Uh, justice will hold us accountable for our actions, but um, it's mercy... And hope you're right. I think that might be where the tensions that we experience on this side are relieved, right? And one of the one of the challenges I think is that, um, and maybe I'm reading too much into it by saying this is a Syriac aspect uh, or an Eastern aspect. I think there are, I think one of our um, hesitancies, one of our uh, difficulties, is to let paradoxes remain, right? We want to break down the paradoxes often. So, for example, justice and mercy, you know, what will, um, you know, how will I be judged at the end? Um, that's one. Let me, another example is the, the paradox between faith and works, the relationship between faith and works, right? And so we want to resolve those paradox all the time. But being a, being a person of faith means, I think, that there's going to be some paradoxes that we have to allow to remain that can only be resolved in, in God's, um, in, in God's kind of, uh, time and God's knowledge. I've been thinking also about this in cosmological or sort of metaphysical terms where I guess I'll, I'll go to another a brief quote, which is that uh, he says at one point, as a grain of sand cannot counterbalance a great quantity of gold. So in comparison, God's use of justice cannot counterbalance his mercy. 
like a handful of sand thrown into the great sea, so are the sins of the flesh in comparison with the mind of God. And just as a strongly flowing spring is not obscured by a handful of dust, so the mercy of the Creator is not stemmed by the vices of his creatures. And that makes me think about Paul and about this question of the flesh, which, you know, I grew up evangelical and I was, you know, blessed to be around many holy people. But I think, at least in that context, the the sort of uh, dialectical or polemical or paradoxical relationship between flesh and spirit was not really emphasized. But I think maybe that is part of it, is that as, you know, bound to the flesh, we're in a sort of hopeless uh, Sisyphean, you know, struggle And, you know, were God to really just apply justice with no mercy, as uh, Father Thomas said and as others said in the the call, uh, we'd be hopelessly lost. Well, existence, right? Existence is already a a facet of God's mercy. Uh, When when we ask about, like, the the problem of evil, for instance, you know, uh, we we look forward to the resurrection, but in the meantime... um, you know, part of, if you want to phrase it, part of doing business for God is allowing us to exist despite the things that we do to ourselves and the things that happen in, within nature, right? So there's already a mercy merely in allowing us the the time and the spiritual uh, ability to mature and to, to engage with these things, right? If, if God were... If God were emphasizing justice in the way that sometimes uh, we might think he, he should, then, you know, there's there's no earth to begin with. It's just God in, in the Trinity. I, I, I just want to read, uh, I really loved Isaac's point. I think that the ex- about existence about that, you know, what, and that goes back to the initial quote of like, so seeing creation itself as, as the most compassionate act itself, as that God, God creating um, anything is a sign of his love and compassion and mercy. Uh, and uh, on that uh, side of the scale, more than on the justice side, let's let, I just want to read very quickly. Um, oh God, for you, for uh, this is Isaac, oh God, for without my having asked you or even having existed, you brought me into existence. This is something that we hear that um, even in... Um, uh, Philoxenus of Marburg also has this has the same same expression as well. You, without without you know, uh, there's a um, I think it's even in the in the Russian writers, right? Like, hey, we didn't ask to be to be born, but even without that, that love is what really makes made us to who we are, right? And to make everything, to make to create uh, the whole world, and so. Um, and it's it's the mercy that allows us to even exist, which is the mercy that we hope will allow us to remain with Him, um, even after um, whatever the next point. Hmm. And when it comes to this question of nature and of mercy and of love and creation, maybe uh, you both can uh, take turns discussing. Another paradox, which is the paradox of, you know, we should love the creation, we should love nature, we should weep tears for the suffering of creatures, and their very existence is itself a sort of miraculous gift, but at the same time, we we have to be on guard against loving the world, and against uh, sort of the passions that are proposed, and there's this ascetical program, which in some of his writings is quite stark, and so I was wondering if you could maybe both just uh, reflect on that. Immediately, I think of um, the world as it is presented in, in the Gospel of John, right? When you talk about that. So in, in John, you know, John's, uh, the Gospel of John, the most famous verse that, you know, uh, every American has seen in baseball games, John three sixteen, for God so loved the world. So God loves the world. But then at the same time, in, you know, in the high, um, farewell address in John 14 and forward, Jesus says, but you're not of this world. So the world as it is and the world as it ought to be, right? The world as it ought to be is the world that God wants to be transformed. God, the way, the way that the world, God created the world. But the world as it is, is the world that rejected Jesus, 
right? In John's, the prologue itself, he says, he came into the world, but the world did not know him and the world rejected him. So if this world rejected Jesus, um, how can we be friends with the world? Right? And, but at the same time, we have to, when we look at the world, we see the world for, so we see the world for what it ought to be. We, we um, because of our proximity to Christ, we see, we can look at the world and see what it ought to be. And that's why we weep for creation. That's why we, we, we uh, pray for the demons because these are, these are all need to be, um, these all need to return to Christ. And so we, we know the potential that they all, or we can understand the potential they all have because the burning heart within us is the burning heart that is burning for the potential that I myself need to grow into and have not attained to yet. That's very interesting. I, I, it reminds me, I was reading uh, in uh, Sergei Bulgakov and his philosophy of economy. He talks about sort of like the, the true, like the sophic uh, grace of God is shining through the corrupt uh, sort of material fallen world that we know. And so that when we admire like a beautiful sunset or something, even though there is, you know, evil or corruption or death or degradation or entropy or whatever occurring, there's still this sort of spiritual, like we see it spiritually and we recognize its sort of spiritual end or its spiritual beginning. We don't, we don't see it, you know, we don't see a, a loved one for their sort of like slowly decompo- decomposing flesh. Yeah, and I was interested in how this extends to um, the way that Isaac talks about demons, because I think there's sort of this folk understanding as demons, as malevolent entities that are, you know, almost have a power that, well, it can never overcome God, it's in competition with God. And here he talks about demons more as, you know, as creatures that God, you know, decidedly loves, but also as angels who are blinded in some way and can't harm people or act toward their own ends they they just they can't act the same way that angels can and are, are almost sent to to test us and and um, send us the, the suffering passions that he talks about um, later in the past which we read well I, the question I hear uh, John I think is that what does it mean to um, to think that creation is good, but then also to have a, uh, um, a fully developed demonology, right? You know, and, right. So, um, I, I, and this is, this is something that gets a lot, has gotten lots of people into lots of trouble. Hey, can, can, can the devil, um, repent and come back to Christ? Right. And you know, that it's, um, and I think if we, say that it's not possible, then we don't, we're not fully in line with the gospel. The, the potential should exist, whether he will or not. That's, you know, I, I, I'm a little agnostic on the universalist question and people love Isaac because of the, the universalist uh, appeal. Um, I, I'm sorry, Isaac, I, I didn't mean to offend you. <laughs> you had... No, I was chuckling. It was your fault. <laughs> but no, you're, you're right. I mean, the, you know, um, I think that what you're getting at is is very true that there's there's a tendency as theology develops where we start treating spirits, angels or otherwise as um, less than fully creatures, right? They end up being sort of this this the divine robots or the infernal robots. And I think that to to understand what Isaac uh, the saint is saying um, and not speaking the third person um, to, to, to understand that we, we have to engage with with uh, spirits as legitimate creatures of God um, and I think that that is, I think that there needs to be more space within Christianity uh, to view them as you know some of them as holy obviously some of them as decidedly unholy and then some that are just like us who may be uh to different degrees attempting to do what is right or indifferent to what is right or or whatever i mean there's i think there's a whole if if we're going to look at them seriously as into intellectual beings and as moral beings then they have to have 
a lot of the same complexities and nuances that we ourselves have. Otherwise, we're sort of shortchanging them. Can I can I ask a follow-up? I know that I'm not the host, but I want to ask a question. <laughs> I, I know. I, know. I want to. I want to ask a question to Isaac. I think. Um, I think one of the other. Um, uh, I think something else to kind of footnote on this. If, if if I'm wondering whether you agree with me on this, is that one of the footnotes that we should do when we talk about demonology is that for the um, you know the, the 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 ancient writers, demonology was also part of their psychology, like how they talked about. Um, the human psyche, right? So, um, so for example, they say, "Oh, I succumbed to the demon of uh, gluttony," uh, and that is kind of a talking about the the inner struggle. And um, there, we might not want to pray for that demon of gluttony. I'm just, what do you think? <laughs> no, I yeah, I mean, there's, um, you know, it's always we have to always be careful about superimposing ideas that are foreign to other times and cultures but tentatively yes i i you know if i if i step out of my skeptical academic box and just have a conversation yes uh, i agree that a lot of times these these uh these demons are you know a, a response to something that's going on inside and and not necessarily um exertion by another will right so so you're right that you know we if we're talking in terms of psychology yes we're, we're you know these are not um it's it's a it's a psychological problem well I, no, I didn't mean to dismiss the idea of demons uh, having agency and and um and uh, be, and being real and moral force and culpable i just meant that at times they're not talking at times when you know the the ascetics are talking about being plagued by the demons, I I don't think those are the demons that they're that Isaac is having compassion for. Right. Yeah. I, that makes sense. And and my you know I've I've been a professor for for too long now, so I can't give straight answers anymore. But I, <laughs> yes, I, I I agree with you. What about this notion of passions, because I forget where I read this. It might have been in the life of Anthony. But I read somewhere that there's this concept that passions are actually much more deadly and dangerous than demons are. Because, you know, a demon arrives, you can invoke the name of the Lord, make the sign of the cross. And, uh, you know, according to St. Anthony, at least, he frequently, you know, conquers demons in manifold ways. But with the passions, it's something that is sort of installed within us. And, you know, it was only relatively recently as I sort of got interested in uh, reading the the Eastern uh, Fathers, that I really began to sort of engage with this question of the passion. So, in case you know people listening to this are not aware of what this concept is, can someone explain what do we mean by passions? Where do they come from? How are they fought? What is their role in our life? Uh, I mean, you know, I, I think probably most people are going to be, hopefully, you know, aware of, for instance, the in the West you have the seven deadly sins, right? Um, but that I, I think what the, I think what the passions really come down to and what's sort of been an undercurrent a lot of this conversation is the emphasis on self, right? It's the, it's the triumph of your own will over what, uh, is more important, which could variously be love of God or love of neighbor or ideally, obviously both. But it's, 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 uh, you know, the things that, that take you away from, um, take you away from those loves by distracting you with sort of your own volition. Yeah. Just dis disordered affections. Yeah, that would be, that'd be a way to put it. Um, you know, the, I mean, this, uh, the, the, the early, the earlier you get, the, the less that it's necessarily about lust, for instance, and the more it's on gluttony. Um, and I think, you know, that they, they would, they would view these, um, tendencies towards self-indulgence as leading to other indulgences, right? That, that do, um, distract and and become sort of drives of their own i mean i i think certainly in the internet era um people are going to be aware of this with for instance pornography right um a, a lot of people 
struggle with that as an issue that that sort of takes on a life of its own where they might even they might even be saying i don't want to do these things but it becomes a kind of compulsion and so i think we can we can view the passions in a similar sense and what about the sort of wild asceticism that he uh that you know uh that saint isaac and others propose is that something you know that's related to his context as a sort of hermit living in a cave is that something that we should you know can we apply that today right were these prescriptions that he he was giving to other you know monks and aesthetics because they seemed very he he went so far as to to call bodily health um you know a, a, a kind of passion to him too well uh, i i think uh, and and father thomas can can speak on this some as well oh, and i hope he does um but it's the um yeah i mean it's it's so i don't want to discount it as saying that it's a product of the time but at the same time we we have to remember that we're we're particular christians in a particular space and era and um so for instance you know um when you talk about like an all-day fast or or something like that some of these extreme ascetical practices right they're they're also not working right so that's sort of the you, you know you see this a lot in like inquirers for instance or, or recent converts that they're you know i'm going to do i'm not going to eat for three days at the beginning of great lent or or whatever and the you know the the problem is that you are uh you know you're working at your office or uh, in retail or something like that right these 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 monks these ascetics who did that that's all they did right so they're also consuming calories that are you know sort of in balance with the fact that they're not taking they're not taking any calories but they're also not burning very many they're spending their time in prayer um so uh, during these periods anyway so you know there there's definitely there's a danger in applying a zeal that doesn't match the reality of our lives because that can become a day that can itself become a passion right and and some of the especially very early on a lot of the the syriac monastics kind of get a reputation among other monastics for for going to extremes that start to kind of worry people so um but anyway if, if you'd like to contribute i'll stop talking <laughs> yeah no no I, I i i'm just enjoying the um your, your reflections on that i i uh, as a pastor i deal with this also to a certain degree right i, I deal i deal with this and I, I also i deal with this on both on both extremes right on the one hand i deal with this on uh what you were saying uh isaac the 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 zeal of um uh, of uh you know enthous- enthusiastic zeal right and they 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 want to you know be the stylite you know be the be the person who is kind of um uh going to be um uh silent for all great all 40 days of great lent or or who's gonna give up you know lots of kinds of lots of food and different things different regimens and then also then also the other extreme which I think <laughs> pastorally I deal with more frequently is that, oh no, asceticism doesn't apply to me. Asceticism only applies to, uh, to the monks in the desert. And, and, you know, I, Hey, I might occasionally go to a monastery and admire the monastic zeal of the monks there, but uh, that's something for me to look through a window and, you know, kind of see as a, to gaze at and not something to be, to be applied. But asceticism at its core is really about exercise. Right. And, all, just like human beings need exercise for their their physical well-being, the spiritual life needs exercises exercise as well. So the all of us are ascetics. Not all of us are monks, but all of us are all of us are called to be a, to a, to have to lead an ascetical life, and we see Christ exemplifying that model for us. We and um, when we are when we live that when we try to live that ascetical life we can look at these exemplars and we can look at their the these ideals um but that doesn't mean that we ought to try to do what they're doing i mean you know hey uh, this is a little bit of maybe this is might be a little too much information for your first podcast but i also try to keep try to do exercises right and so sometimes in order to do exercise i try to mo- motivate myself and you know so, so at least recently i was listening to uh, this uh, mo- motivational tape by arnold Schwarzenegger talking about how he spent five hours in the gym 
the greatest feeling you can get in a gym or the most satisfying feeling you can get in a gym is the pump. Let's say you train your biceps, blood is rushing into your muscles and that's what we call the pump. Your muscles get a really tight feeling, like your skin is going to explode any minute. You know, it's really tight. It's like somebody blowing air into into your muscle. It just blows up, and it feels different. It, it feels fantastic. Hey, if I do that, if I go into the gym and I spend five hours in the gym a day, my body's gonna die. Like I'm just gonna literally kill myself. So why would I do that? And but but that doesn't mean I don't listen to Schwarzenegger's you know motivational speech. I, I see that, and I and I and I see what he, um, the work that he put into it, because that motivates me to want to put in the effort that I can for my for my life that I can do at my own level. But if I if if all I did was I say I looked at Schwarzenegger and said, hey, that's that's really that's really great what what a human being can do with his body, and don't put any exercise into it. That's also not good. So and, and this I think is where um, you know the the need for us to be. And, you know, that's also one of the aesthetical ideals is the, the ra- along with all of this radical physical um, discipline is also a radical di- obedience to the community and to the elder. Right. And which is where, you know, there's a, 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 a priest in my in my church who was considered a very saintly uh, monk, uh, a saintly figure. He was a monk who was a very saintly figure. And in his um, he has these in his book, there's a, a in the beginning of his book, there's a letter from him to the to the to the elder bishop asking, hey, can I? Um, he's asking permission to to be silent for the entire Great Lent, and then in it is the in the book is the the reply from the from the bishop saying, no, you ought not to do that, and then it prescribes the the silence that's re- that you that he ought to do in that Great Lent. All to say, like that. You know, it, just like exercise. Hey, you know, as I was, you know, as I was trying to get back in shape, one of the things I did was I was working out with a trainer. And that's a, that's a really great analogy, I, I think, and it's exactly right that you know you we're, we're all of us called to do something, and ideally our asceticism should increase with time, but that it is a training, and that if you go, you know, if you don't do anything, it's not healthy. If you go zero to sixty, that's also not healthy. <laughs> So um, I just wanted to read a little bit from uh, Paul's epistle to the Corinthians, where he says, Now to the unmarried and the widows I say, good for them if they also remain as I am. But if they cannot remain continent, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to be a fire. And regarding the married, I enjoin, or rather not I but the Lord, a woman not to be separated from her husband, and a man not to divorce his wife. And I, I bring this up because I think when we talk about asceticism, there's this sort of radical dimension to the, the struggle between the flesh and the spirit in the New Testament. And, um, you know, just reading it for myself, sometimes I'm really struck by it. And like when you read in St. Isaac, it seems, it can seem very extreme or very stark. And um, St. Paul seems to have this approach that is very merciful to the fact that we are weak and you know, I'm a married man, and I, before I was married, I was certainly a fire, and being married certainly helped that fire uh, reduce. And I was just wondering, when we when we come to these sort of great works of St. Isaac or anyone else that's written by monks and addressed to monks, as far as I understand, how, how should those of us who are not in that state uh, relate to that? Very carefully. Yes. I think that you can read St. Isaac or, or uh, any of these fathers, but it has to be transposed into an appropriate key. One of the things St. Isaac himself says is do not receive advice from someone whose lifestyle is different from yours. It's very interesting. Now he's talking to hermits saying, they shouldn't receive advice from people who are not also hermits. But I think transposing it into a key that is more applicable to everyone, I think we all have to be careful that, um, you know, if you're a married person, probably most of your advice should come from a married priest. It doesn't mean that you can't go to the monastery and get some good advice on 
some aspect of your life from a very holy man or woman at a monastery, but you've got to be careful because, you know, a man who lives uh, as a hermit uh, may not always, may be very, very holy, but may not always understand how that holiness plays out in a family with children and uh, uh, with a husband who has to work 50, 60 hours a week, you know, it's... I think, I think we see this on the internet too, right? If you spend enough time online, you'll come across people who will give advice whether they should be giving any advice or not, but they'll give advice to people who are in radically different um, circumstances than them. And there's often a tendency to forget that you're dealing with actual human beings, right? And that these things can have consequence. You know, if you, let's say that you are, um, you know, you're you're very pious, and you you decided that you know you need to you feel compelled to share with someone that they should be following these canons and these canons and these canons. Well, you know, it, you that can easily turn into detrimental advice. Um, so, I mean, obviously, you shouldn't be receiving spiritual advice from strangers in the first place, but I agree with your point about that you should be, and Isaac's point, that you should be matched to, um, to like states. So, where would you suggest the unmarried non-monastics seek advice? Wherever they can find it. <laughs> Because you have, it's like going to the doctor, right? You go to a doctor and he doesn't really help you. What do you do? Give up and say, there's no doctor for me? No, you get a second opinion. You, you search for a spiritual father until you find one who touches your soul and speaks to your heart. In our, in our day, there are many people that have no definite form of life or community to speak of. Like maybe they have a job, maybe they don't have a job, maybe because of, you know, coronavirus, they've been living alone. You know, one of my coworkers, he was locked down in his, you know, studio apartment. It was like 30 square meters for three months. I, I myself am not orthodox, but I've always been curious in it and exploring that. And you see, you know, especially online, there are a lot of people who don't have this form of life, who aren't rooted in a parish or any kind of community, but come to orthodoxy for, you know, very mistaken reasons. Um, you know, people who are on the alt-right and have this, you know, conception of, of orthodoxy just being, you, you know, they have this idea of uh, Western civilization that they're trying to maintain and, um, you know, they're, they're, they're coming to it for, for the wrong reasons and because they don't have a community, they're, they're sort of reinforcing this, this very broken way of, of looking at faith. And what would you advise to, to people like this who, you know, and, and, and again, maybe because of coronavirus, maybe because of other life circumstances, they don't really have access to parish life right now, but they're still coming to faith through this very broken mirror that's being reflected to them by other people who are coming at it like that. And, um, you know, wh wh what would you do, especially, and also talking about Isaac's um, you know, radical mercy, like how would you show radical mercy and, and draw these people into a, a healthier kind of way of relating to and continuing to find faith? Well, that's huge. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have a couple of thoughts um, that I, I, I think that John's um, question uh, brings in my mind. The first is that I think, um, and I think what Henry was sharing also is, we have to, we realize that we're, on the one hand, we're in the most connected time and uh, the potential for communication is at its, um, you know, we, through the technology we have, never unprecedented. Uh, you know, literally people die because they're texting while driving, right? Like they're like communicating while they're driving when they shouldn't be and they're communicating and they die because of that and cause other people to die. But at the same time, we live in the most loneliest time ever. And you know, if anything, coronavirus probably brought that to the fore. And I also feel that um, the, the the phenomena that John spoke about—that um, you know, young people, 
who are disillusioned by life around them getting drawn into another alternative life through the internet is is it is not just an orthodox phenomenon it's everywhere and and i think that's where something we're um people that's why i'm happy to be on on a podcast like this um what i have realized is that in the small time that i have tried to kind of be on Twitter, I've been able to connect with many young people, many people who, uh, and the the question of mercy, you said, I, I, when I see people become overly zealous and overly, and, and express their anger and, um, you know, be overly scrupulous about, you know, minute uh, matters and stuff, I have compassion on them because I too was a, one, a once a very zealot young man myself, so I see myself in them, and so I try m- my best to keep a, a channel open. Sometimes it gets the best; they, their anger gets the best of me, and I, you know, I don't. But uh, I'm I, I'm optimistic that I think that um, through uh, remaining merciful and compassionate, um, that. Uh, we can do that, but I, I, that I, that's all. Those are all just reflections. Doesn't answer your question really. What is somebody like that to do? Not, I mean, wrong and right, whatever. It's the person's reason, and it's the person's journey. Uh, and I might be able to stand back in some idealized, objective state, which doesn't actually exist, and try to judge it as whether it's better or worse or good or bad. But it is the person, it's their journey, it's what they're worried about, it's what they're struggling with. And and where radical mercy comes in is you meet that person where they're at. And if they're a white supremacist or if they're a black whatever or a, wh- wherever they're at. And so, you know, my parish is full of people on the left and on the right and they're all fermenting about this or that and and so we bring them to Christ so that peace can come to their heart and that they can find a kind of um, grounding that isn't in this turmoil of thoughts about how unfair the world is or how unfair their mother was or how unfair mm. the the uh, you know the culture was to them or to their group or uh, and try to uh, bring them peace in Christ. Well, I think that, that you can make a liturgical comparison too. Um, so if you're you know, let's say you're a young priest, you come to a parish, you don't like the way that the liturgy is going there, perhaps whatever manner of abuses or or, or whatever. Right. If you if you change it all at once, what's going to happen? Right. Everybody everybody gets upset. They leave. The bishop moves you if you're lucky. You know, it's just there's there's all manner of bad ways that can go. So what does somebody with experience or at least prudence do? They change what they can and they do it incrementally and then, you know, over time. um, And and often that comes with explanation. Here's why what you are doing is not ideal and what we should be doing instead but it but it has to be all these things have to be pastoral right so um when you do have and i think a lot of a lot of extremists are not coming into the churches they're claiming an identity but aren't actually showing up but when you do when you do get people like that you know you you have to use their energy as best you can because they're creatures of God, the same as anybody else. And you don't let them hurt the community, but you you do have to be pastoral and careful with how you approach things like that, right? Because otherwise, it's, it's I mean, you know, having a big fight and saying get out doesn't help anybody either. I was just going to ask uh, both, you know, uh, the pastors that are here on the call. I think Father, Father Michael spoke about the personal reality as opposed to some kind of view from nowhere, you know, that doesn't really exist. And, you know, I'm not a pastor, but when I sort of move in the world, I feel that there are personal brands everywhere, even between friends. There are these sort of, you know, there's this sort of a superficial, ironic, whatever you want to call it, distance between our lives 
and who we are as you know people, like personal reality. And I think, you know, even if you look at you know political philosophy or the way that people talk about life, there's really no room for the personal, even though uh, we're supposed to be you know so comparing you know com- compassionate and, and sympathetic. I was just wondering how do you how do you get to that personal reality? How do you overcome whatever is the sort of superficial uh, fake objective obstacle? I think Father Michael said it a little earlier that you have to meet them where they're where they're at, right? That um, um, I think one of the one of the the beauties of being one of the one of the things I enjoy of being a pastor is uh, one of my professors said, you know, the the banquet of humanity, right? We get to experience like humanity for its 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 wide. Um, and breadth is width and its breadth. It's it's you know it, with all its complexities, with all its challenges, and um, and uh, but I think also to reveal to show yourself as as a human yourself, yeah, without you know to show to to acknowledge that that I am a human myself. That um, I think might <laughs> because they also. Um, uh, once they see that you are a human, they might be willing. I think someone might be willing to more um, uh, let go of the the false image that they want to uh, they want you to see. Yeah, I think you have to. You don't have to be a pastor very long, or you don't even have to be a caring person very long before you realize that every single human being is in deep pain and. And we may all point at different, you know, like Adam and Eve in the garden, right? It's her, it's the snake, it's the apple, it's this, it's that. We, it, and so where St. Isaac has helped me in this is the emphasis of entering into the cell, which would be your heart, right? And helping people, like helping people enter the cell and learning how to stay in the cell instead of seeing my problems as out there and um because i can't fix those but but if i can enter into the cell of my heart and abide there just for a few minutes every day and get a habit of staying there then a new reality begins to form. A a new identity begins to form. I begin to see who I am in Christ and and maybe nothing changes on the outside. Maybe everything is as crappy and terrible as it had been before. But as I change, I mean, what happens is I start to develop a bit of compassion. And and then that very enemy who was persecuting me, I start to experience a bit of pity, right? Shakespeare says pity is a species of love. I, I love that line. Um, that And when I can start to experience a bit of pity in my heart, even for, like St. Isaac says, the lizards, <laughs> right? For um, then, it, again, the circumstances may not change at all. But I start to change, and as I start to change, how I engage those circumstances change. And then suddenly I start, relationships start to change. and. I start to see things I hadn't seen before, and I start to take advantage, perhaps, of the opportunities that I didn't see before, and um, and connections, right? So that two people who originally hated each other could actually, you know, come to some small understanding of each other. But of course, this is a lifetime process. I mean, this is not something you do in 10 minutes. You spend your whole life in this this struggle. But it has to start somewhere, right? And it starts by learning to go into the cell. 
and to abide in the cell with Christ and um, not to go out unnecessarily. I think you 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 hit on something there too that there's this um, this personal component that's important, and you see this. I mean, you know, in in attempts to reconcile people who have fallen victim to hateful ideologies, you see this a lot, right? Where they they'll get them to communicate one on one because it's it's so difficult, especially when you know somebody. It's difficult to hate when you when you know someone, right? And when you engage with a person, right? That's why that's why we always dehumanize and we abstract and we uh, generalize because that's what allows us to be um, unloving, right? Because these are just ideas instead of people. And I, I think that's something that Father Michael was, was sort of hitting on. So, um... I live in, you know, I live in France, and it's a very secular country, and um, we've had a lot of lockdowns. We're in a sort of bizarre lockdown right now, where from six p.m. six p.m. to six a.m. we're not allowed to leave the house without a sort of written uh, permission slip from the government. And you know, this is the third kind of phase of some kind of, you know, pretty serious uh, isolation that the general populace has been. Uh, subjected to and as I alluded to before I think a lot of people are suffering and you know so if someone's listening to this and you know maybe they're not a Christian maybe they don't believe in God maybe they don't you know have any particular religious faith whatsoever or let's say someone's listening to this and they know someone like that what 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 is you know can just anybody enter into the cell what's the first step to get into the cell how can you how can you take a lockdown and, and turn it from a suffering into a sort of suffering that's actually generative of a sort of new self or of a, a form of life that's uh, that's alive and not just sort of being being toward death? I have an acquaintance who I correspond with who spent about twenty years in solitary confinement. Wow. Um, and I was visiting him once at the supermax prison in Colorado. Uh, at the same time, a psychologist was doing a study of all the inmates there. All the inmates there are in solitary confinement. And uh, we got to chatting and he found out who I was visiting and he told me, oh, you know, this, this guy, he's one of the few inmates who's still sane, still relatively sane. Um, and I, I know him, I worked with him for a long time. Uh, and part of the transition is to take the, the evil that's imposed on you, whether it's a disease or a sickness or a government or a ideology, whatever it is, take that evil and say, um, okay, God, um, However I got here, you are now here with me. I mean, I don't know if it would be possible for an atheist to do this. Maybe they could. I do know one atheist who sort of had a relationship with the universe. But that was kind of, as it sort of, you know, as I got to know him better, um, I got to realize that what he was calling the universe was probably what I was calling God. <laughs> but, uh, but because it was a personal universe and etc., uh, or close to it. Um, but you know, this is like basic Alcoholics Anonymous 101 here, right? Mm -hmm. You've got to connect to the higher power. You've got you can't just be by yourself, and you have to meet that. You have to meet God in your suffering and believe that he's there with you. And then, then the suffering God is, is a God who's accessible and knowable. Um, and so I think that in this time of lockdown and, and real frustration, um, it's, I've gotten lots of people reaching out to me, just strangers, um, because in their lockdown, 
they've kind of discovered something inside themselves. I'm not alone, right? I'm. Uh, there's more to me than just me. There's a door inside me that opens up and and I can meet my creators. Someone much, much bigger than me <laughs> has access to me. And I, I encounter that. And I don't even know what it is. And, um, yeah, it, it, it's not easy. It's not, does it, like I say, and it may not change anything on the outside, but it will start to change you if you pay attention to that. And I think that's why there are hermits. There are human beings who have discovered that this <laughs> that this God that they come to know inside themselves is is huge, is huge, and and changes everything. Father, Father Michael, if I could just follow up on that. Don't you think there is one of the reasons for that inability is just a lack of uh, a consciousness of the inner person that we have this cell within us, right? That so we just we're so and I think I sometimes I think I see that even in, in believers that they are um, are so focused on externals that. Um, they lack the ability to, to, to for that self awareness to to realize that there is that. And I, and I and I wonder if that your the the your acquaintance, you're the the person that you know from who was in solitary, and that psychologist, um, the, that psychologist uh, saying that oh that person has remained sane. How much of it is because that individual uh, is so aware of their own inner? Cell and that which that is something that cannot be imprisoned. Oh, I think so. I think a hundred percent, because then they're not alone in their suffering, and that, and you can't even if you know we all want to escape suffering, but we all discover that a lot of suffering you can't escape from. It's just imposed on you. Something very ugly can actually transfigure into something that's almost beautiful. Not the ugliness outside, but what is happening. I, I liken it to compost, right? Or manure, right? Like you have this big pile of, or shit, forgive me, but then, you know, just big pile. And, and then there's daisies growing around the edge. And the question is, what are you going to pay attention to? Are you going to pay attention to the big pile of crap that everybody has in their life? You think you're, you're worse off than the next guy. But actually, everyone's hurting really bad. But what are you going to pay attention to? because it's actually the manure, it's actually the crap that's feeding the flowers. And, and if you pay attention to the flowers, the crap doesn't go away, but you can be transformed by the beauty of the flower that's there. Or you can ignore the flowers altogether and just be frustrated and angry about the crap in your life. which doesn't do anything, doesn't help. I, there is a question that I've, I've had written down here about connecting this sort of personal work of going within the cell. And how, how does that relate to, you know, the issues in broader society? Because, you know, it's all well and good for me to sort of repair my own life. But obviously, you know, uh, our Lord did not, you know, just remain in sort of a heavenly bliss, but came into the sort of cave of this world to to rescue, you know, to rescue us. And so as we go into the cell, for example, is going into the cell itself enough? Is going into the cell, will that, will that do the work of, 
you know, of a uh, tikkun olam, of 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 uh, of apocatastasis, of uh, restoring the world, of of uh, of of sort of suffusing the world with the the divine grace that we're called to sort of work work out this faith with fear and trembling, or is there a need to come out of the cell as well? Like, do you go into the cell and then come out of it? How do how do how do we think about that when we we think about the fact that I'm suffering and my neighbor is suffering, and you know, as Isaac says, the whole world is suffering, and the uh, the the sort of self is this this uh, sanctuary for God's hiddenness and tabernacle for His mysteries, the place where He can dwell. Well, I think I think one of the things that maybe Saint Isaac's tapping into, and that that is present in the Syriac tradition. Is there's a there's definitely a, a very active sense of spirituality, um, even going back to sort of the proto monastic movement, right? You have the brothers and sisters of the covenant, um, and and one of the things that comes out of that sort of tradition is this idea of, and obviously they they have the same they they develop some of the same monastic practices later, but that there is this idea of, you know. Um, urban communities or at least you know villages and, and people who are active in the community and prayer um, as a form of community service or if you want to say it the other way community service as a form of prayer um, and uh, to, to what degree that's that's going to be present in the sixth and seventh century um, is, is maybe less clear but there, there is this sort of idea um, but I think that, you know, the, I had somebody once recently tell me, you know, oh, I'm just a Christian. You know, other, you know, we talk about this denomination, this de- denomination. I'm just a Christian. But the thing is, we are all of us a specific person in a specific circumstance um, and specific Christianity uh, at that. And so I, I think it's it's difficult to make a sweeping statement of what we should do right there's there's what what i should do there's what you should do which maybe only you can know um so you know i think that the that um hermits and then people who are more active in the community in a more physical way are sort of intention but that they're not a they're not opposed to each other, and one is not necessarily doing work in a way that they shouldn't. Right? That that the the hermit, um, maybe in that specific instance, is doing something specific to them that is just as useful or important on a spiritual level as as a more physical, hands-on sort of work would be for somebody else. But that that we can't. We, we can't just say um, this is what you should do and that's a universal for, for all Christians. I think um, related to what uh, Isaac is saying, this um, we, you know, this might also be kind of what I said earlier about the paradoxes that have to kind of remain. Like we don't have to choose between uh, the active life uh, or the internal um, life. And, and also uh, uh, in I think in, in our present moment, there's so much focus on the active life and how, you know, it's something that you and I talked about, Henry, like about how everybody wants to talk about how we can build up the kingdom of God, right? So so perhaps what we can learn from St. Isaac, Saint Isaac of, of Syria, and perhaps what we can learn from the other hermits is that, you know, there is an internal life that if we ignore you, you, that if you if you ignore the internal life, any effort you make at being an activist, at an active life of trying to change the um, build the kingdom of God is going to be a failure, and it's going to be actually probably detrimental to your own well being because you 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 don't have anything to pour out from, right? Um, so you know there's uh, lots of commentaries about how we can change the world right now, right? What we need to do to change the world. And, and you know, even even in the present moment, like l- literally people are saying, okay, what is it that we need to do to make sure that we remain? Well, what, what if we t- took Seraphim of Saros um, advice and said, wait, the way to change the world is to acquire the Holy Spirit mm-hmm. and a thousand around you will be saved. And, and it's worth pointing out that, that St. Isaac himself fled an active life. 
right? That he he was he was bishop for a handful of months, and you know it was for his personal situation. And clearly, none of us have see that as a detriment to his holiness. Um, that that he felt the need to to go and be a hermit and and to um, experience God in that way, despite having not only the ability but the authority to be more active in a community. I'm very blessed to have three hermits who live in the mountains in British Columbia. They used to be a little closer to Vancouver, but then people kept visiting them. And they said, we had to run away because we were becoming caricatures of ourselves, right? We, uh, we weren't being who people thought we were. And so they had to, so now they're way up in the mountains and where it's really cold all the time. A place called the Caribou. <laughs> the name gives it away. <laughs> they, they really carry the burden of people who do stuff. You know, the, the abbot, the old man of the three, anytime I, I bring up a situation, someone in the hospital or some bad situation, he says, it's my fault. Wow. Because of my sin, he really sees himself as repenting for the whole world, for maybe those like me who are too busy trying to take care of people to really spend much time repenting much. So there's a kind of connection there. It's not either or. Uh, the brothers, once they were in, um, they had to go to a doctor appointment or something, and they had to go into Vancouver. And you can imagine these three very scraggly guys in dirty castles getting off the bus, right? I mean, these are really earthy fellows. And um, they're walking down the street, and they find this woman sitting on the side of the road, and their heart goes out to her. And so they find out, you know, some things about her, and they, they, they literally help her up and walk her. They forgot completely about what they went into the city to do. They, they walk her to the hospital and take her to the hospital so that someone can take care of her. It also seems a little bit more real and 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 sort of doable in daily life because it accepts the necessary limits that we all face. Where, you know, if I take this sort of view from nowhere, objective sweep of the world, and I say, okay, what needs to be done to stop, you know, the coronavirus? There's nothing I can do about that. You know, it's completely out of my hands. All I can do is sort of tend to my my house and my family and my job and try to do what good I can in this context. And I think it's a sort of, or at least at, at this point in my life, the way I feel about it is that there's this kind of, um, you know, there's a sort of good, you know, activism can be very good and being active in the world is a, a positive thing, but there's also a sort of lie that can creep in where you have to say like, okay, well, we're going to like change the world. And, you know, I, I remember the words of uh, Lao Tzu who said that, you know, the world is a sacred object. Nothing should be done to it. To seize it is to, to lose it. Everyone I've, I've seen that tries to seize it comes to harm. And I, I wonder about this sort of, you know, your, your hermits, Father Michael, sound like they're, a, you know, as he would put it, a valley to the world. They're open to the world and whatever comes and willing to embrace it and to love it in the way that St. Isaac talks about. And they have this collective form of life together this like love for each other and this love for the world and compassion for the world and that's the sort of the platform or the ground that they stand on in order to take up this you know this uh, woman that they've met that needs help or whatever i just that's kind of the way i'm trying to think about it in my head but it's a sort of um it's sort of dissatisfying when we when we think about you know compared to the the big projects of you know oh get me elected and i'll do this or that and I think that's why people get so sucked into the sort of culture war, political partisanship is because they want, it's actually easier in a way. You know, if we could just put this all on, you know, Washington, D.C. or whatever, then it would be, you know, it's much simpler than going into the cell. 
Yeah, and I mean, I would like to think that there doesn't have to be this kind of either or that we alluded to, but I, I think like if, if you are trying to do something in the world, whether it's um, political project or something approximate to that, um, if you, uh, you know, I know, I know through through Henry and I's history, you know, we, we found ourselves in those situations, and when you don't have that spiritual life, your your goals really do become very distorted very quickly, and you know, the depression, the anxiety, the kind of paralysis really kicks in. So, I mean, it seems like the other thing, the the kind of interior life, is you know, at least something that has to has to come first. But I, I, you know, I, I still think there's this tension that maybe we're trying to figure out in our lives and maybe through the, the kind of wider project of this podcast about how to negotiate between total political and social quietism and also realizing, you know, the, the kind of folly of just trying to seize power. And um, it seems like, you know, we're all, we're all kind of like hinting at ways to do that. But, um, you know, the, the particularity of it, I'm sure is... A little bit opaque to us still. Um, you know, I'd like to recommend something to you. Um, one of my spiritual uh, sons, one of my spiritual children, runs an institute for religion, peace, and justice. Mm-hmm. And I, I think he's done a pretty good job of trying to help people find ways to work for peace and justice on the one hand, but on the other hand, become peace and justice themselves. Well, there, there's, I think there's truth in what people sometimes will point out, which is that there is no perfect world until the second coming. But often that gets used in, as an excuse to not do anything. And that is not the correct reaction. But at the same time, as, as Father Michael was saying, um, you know, the... It, it you have to you have to pair these right it, what you have what you have a chance of transforming most radically is yourself um and that doesn't mean for all of us anyway to to disengage from the world um in in the sense of repairing it but that that as a project is never finished right so if you if you stray too much into secular ac- uh, activism it becomes this sort of all-consuming, uh, unfinished project that's, you, I, in the end, you're never going to be satisfied with the result if there's not also that spiritual component. One of the things that helps me to reflect on some of these issues that we're facing in North America today is my situation as an immigrant, because I came to America as a 10-year-old. So I, I often think of uh, so then I, uh, you know, I lived in, in rented houses for uh, rented, rented places for a long time. So it always meant that, you know, we're always and when I was young, my, my, when my parents migrated, we had the goal, we would go back to India in five years. So we were always kind of, you know, we're always li- living out of like this idea that, okay, we're everything here is temporary. And that's kind of what Isaac was referring to as like, you know, hey, um, there is no perfect world until the, until the second coming. And we have no lasting city here. We have no permanent home here and we have to remember that we are pilgrims here and it, 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 but, but being pilgrims doesn't mean that we don't have anything at stake in the city. We find ourselves, we are, you know, as I think Isaiah 19, 19 says that, you know, we will build an altar in Egypt. Yeah. We're in Egypt, we're in Babylon, but we're going to be, um, we're going to build the altar there and we want, um, and we want to, to be, able to um, to be salt of the earth that um, that flavors and that preserves we all we want to be the yeast that becomes the positive influence so we don't you know completely um, run away and seclude ourselves from the rest of the world but at the same time we remember that that of course we're going to find uh, the world resembling Babylon and not Jerusalem because Jerusalem still hasn't come yet so we are in Babylon. So, um, yeah, that, that, I think that, so uh, that also helps me to, to kind of not have to find a home in any, um, human project of improvement of society, right? I can align myself with, and I can cooperate with those secular efforts, but I don't, I'm not at home at any of them. 
because I'm truly a pilgrim here. I have no lasting city here. So whatever whatever project you're going to propose to me is something that I'm going to look at and say I'm I'm going to be a uh, critic of really. Okay, maybe I can I can end my questions with this provocation then, which is from uh, Father uh, Bulgakov again. And he says, the kingdom of God has to be won by common work, the creative effort of mankind, as well as the creative work of God. And the reason I bring up this quote or this idea is because I resonate a lot with what Father Thomas is saying about, you know, this, this, this world is not our home. But it seems to me that there's this kind of layering of the world where there's sort of the, the, the fleshly world, or I, I guess to be brief, you know, God created the world good, very, and, you know, very good. And the world fell into corruption and became the world as we know it, the world which is ruled by the, the prince of the power of the air. And Christ has come to liberate us from this sort of uh, domination of sin and death. And so we're here in the flesh to die according to the flesh so that we can live according to the spirit. And there seems to be room for some kind of creative, positive work that we can do here. It's not, and I'm not saying this is, you know, your argument, Father Thomas, but it's not like when I, you know, grew up in evangelicalism, it's not just sort of waiting, you know, biding your time and then, you know, taking the first train out of here. It's, it's we're here to really, to bring it to sort of spiritualize the sort of dead world that we find ourselves in. But I, I agree that it's very paradoxical and it's sort of difficult to understand. It's just this is sort of the provocative thought that was in my head as, as you were all speaking. But we, but we can't add to anything that Christ has done. We can only reveal what, what he has done, right? We can't. That, that's why I'm, I'm hesitant about the language of building up the kingdom of God, whether whether regardless of who says it, right? I, I don't know, Father and Isaac, my, your opinion on this. But I think the idea that we can do something... Um, to kind of build up the kingdom of God when Christ has done everything that needs to be done on the cross, which we which we have to manifest, right? And that goes back to that Isaac reference from Isaac that I was sharing earlier, which is that, you know, what do you say? That these were, they were manifesting on earth the likeness of things to come, which we have to do. And we have to, we have to remind the world of what it, what it needs to become. Yeah, I, I, you know, I think one of the things that we forget uh, sometimes in the way that we think about time is this, this mystical time, so that you are manifesting what's already been accomplished when you do these things. Um, that it, that it isn't as as Father Thomas said, it's not an improvement on the kingdom of God or a building up, it, but it it is a, a manifestation, um, a, a lifting of the veil. Right, that we, you know, in the liturgy and in active, um, active religious life, uh, whether that's secular or specifically monastic, um, the world's a little bit thinner in those places. If you want to take in sort of a, a sci-fi direction, you know, I think uh, another way to also think about this, or to get at it from a slightly different angle, um, the second commandment is to love our neighbor. Um, it's not to make the world a better place, mm -hmm. but it is to love our neighbor, and often to love our neighbor, we need to do what we can to make it better for them. And so it's it's not so much I I don't I personally don't find it helpful to think in terms of making the world better, but I I do find it helpful. To think of the terms of loving my neighbor, which may involve changing the labor laws, or may involve uh, changing, you know, how some things are done, and working to do that because I see my neighbor and my heart goes out to my neighbor, and I see how this oppressive system is affecting my neighbor. If you look at it in terms of uh, of a parent, you know, to, to make sort of a sweeping generalization, in my experience, if you meet people who are like, I'm doing, you know, the things I do, I'm doing for my child's improvement, there tends to be uh, almost a disconnect or a sternness there. Um, 
and often, you know, I, I see that behavior a lot of times with, you know, the dad who really wants the kid to be the baseball star he wasn't or, you know, that sort of thing. But if you look at parenting in terms of love, right, if, if you're a parent and, you know, you do things, but it's it's not there isn't this idea explicitly of I'm turning my child into the adult I want them to be. You're loving them and you're doing what's good for them through that love. Um, so I, I think like, like the others have said, it's, it's a, it, it has to be a lot more organic, right? It's, it's putting love first leads to a lot of the things we'd like to see, but, um, you can't, uh, one of the things that I, that I tell people is that politics always has to be downstream of religion, right? If you start putting, if you start reversing the relationship, then that's when you can get into some really bad places, right it's it's always got to be politics has to naturally flow out of an authentically lived religion and not be the excuse for um uh, not to have religion as sort of a metaphysical excuse for the politics that you're trying to push well i know i know we've been going for quite a while and i don't want to hold you all here forever but i i want to express my sincere thanks and uh, you know, this is the first one of, of these that we've done, so apologies if it was uh, mismanaged or otherwise uh, could be improved. But if anybody has, you know, closing thoughts or a question or anything they want to say, I think it's, you know, I don't have any more questions. Thank you for having, speaking for myself, thank you for having me on. I, I enjoyed it and uh, I look forward to seeing you here in the final product. Yeah, thank you all so much. We really appreciate it.